What if I were now to teach them such a doctrine that at this very sitting their hearts were to be liberated without grasping from the asava? So he addressed them, Bhikkhus, Padante, O Lord, they had responded. The exalted one said this, Incalculable is the beginning, Bhikkhus, of this faring on. The earliest point is not revealed of the running on, the faring on of beings cloaked in ignorance, tied by craving. As to that, what think you, Bhikkhus, which is the greater, the blood that has flowed, that has been shed by the loss of your heads as you have run on, fared on this long while, all the waters in the four seas. And they replied, As we allow, Lord, that we have been taught by the exalted one, it is this that is greater, the blood that has flowed, that has been shed by the loss of our heads as we have run on, fared on this long while, and not the waters of the four seas. Well said, well said, Bhikkhus, well do you allow that I have taught you the doctrine. Even the blood that has been, that has flowed, etc., etc., that is greater. For many a long day did blood flow, was blood shed by the loss of your heads, when you were born oxen, uh, born as oxen, when you were buffaloes, born as buffaloes, born as rams, as goats, as wild animals as fowls, as pigs, more blood than there are waters in the four seas. For many a long day did blood flow, was blood shed by the loss of your heads, and you were seized as robbers, village plunderers, or highwaymen, or when you were seized as adulterers, etc. More blood than there are waters in the four seas. How is this? Incalculable is the beginning, because of this faring on. The earliest point is not revealed of, be of beings running on, faring on, cloaked in ignorance, tied to craving. Thus many a day, because have you been suffering ill, have you been suffering pain, have you been suffering disaster, have the charnel fields or the graves been growing? Thus far enough is there, because for you to be repelled by all the things of this world, enough to lose all passion for them enough to be delivered therefrom. The exalted one spoke this, pleased at heart, those because took delight in that which was spoken by the exalted one. And during the speaking of this discourse, the hearts of the thirty Baba bhikkhus were set free without any grasping from the asava. Uh, I'd like to comment a bit on this sutta. The Buddha said, we have been turning in this samsara, the round of rebirths, for so long that the earliest point, the beginning of time actually, cannot be located. There is a sutta where the Buddha said, when he contemplates the past, he can go and see the past as far back as he wants. And yet, in spite of the fact that he kept on seeing the past, yet he could not find a beginning. There is no beginning to time. In the Buddha's teaching, two things are without limit. One is time and the other is space. The Buddha said time has no beginning and no end. And space has also got no limit. And uh, not very strange. Now, 2,500 years after the Buddha is passing away, we have uh, scientists like Professor Stephen Hawking came up with a book called A Brief History of Time. He also said that two things have no limit in the world. One is space, the other is time. And so the Buddha said, because we have been faring on so long in samsara, we have, we have been uh, suffering so much that the blood that has flowed from our heads uh, is more than the four seas and the waters of the four seas. So the Buddha said it should be enough. We should be tired of all this and uh, we should realize this and try to get out of the round of existence. In other sutta, the Buddha said, <coughs> incredible is the beginning because of this bearing on, etc., uh, etc. Et then the Buddha said, not an easy thing is it because to find a being who during this long many a day 
has not at one time been a mother to you. Now that Sutta, the Buddha said, not an easy thing is it because to find a being who during this long time has not been a father, another one a brother, a sister, a son, a daughter. So from this, these few suttas, huh, we can know that actually of all the beings that we meet, huh, generally we have some affinity from the past. We have been related in the past because we have been coming this round of rebirths for so long that we have forgotten. But you see, if we think about it, this, uh, this world has so many beings, but we don't meet all the beings of this world. We only meet a limited number of beings, and those that we meet are all those that have affinity with us from the past. from the Samyutta Nikaya uh, 42.6 Once the Bhagawa, exalted one, was staying at Nalanda in Pavarika Mango Grove, then Asi Bandaka's son, the headman, came to see the exalted one and on coming to him, saluted him and sat down at one side. So seated, Asi Bandaka's son, the headman, said to the exalted one, Lord, the Brahmins of the West who are carriers of water pots bearers of lily gardens, purifiers by water, fire worshippers. When a man has died and made an end, they lift him up and carry him out, call on him by name and speed him heavenwards. But the exalted one who is Arahant and all enlightened one is able to bring it about that the whole world and body breaks up after death and be reborn in the happy lot in the heaven world. I stop here while to comment. This Pahulu, uh, the eight man, came to tell the Buddha, said, as a type of Brahmins, when their relations pass away, they bring, him, they bring his corpse outside, and then all the relations come and shout his name and ask him to go to heaven. And because he is facing the heaven, they believe that he can go to heaven. So he is asking the Buddha, he said, the Buddha is an Arahant, Samasam Buddha. Surely you can bring all living beings to the heaven without us shouting. It's a very interesting question, whether ultimately the Buddha can bring us all to heaven or not. So the Buddha said, As to that headman, I will question you. You may reply as you think fit. Now what do you think, headman? Suppose there's a case where a man is a taker of life, a killer, a taker of what is not given, a wrongdoer in respect of sensual passion, a liar, a backbiter of bitter speech, a babbler and covetous of malevolent heart or perverted view. Then a great multitude gathers and throngs together, aspires and praises him, and goes about with uplifted palms, saying, May this man, when body breaks up after death, be reborn in the happy lot in the heaven world. What do you think, head man? Would that man, owing to the aspirations and praises of that great multitude, owing to their going about with uplifted hands, would that man, when body breaks up after death, be reborn in the happy lot in the heaven world? Then Asi Bandakaputta replied, Surely not, Lord. I stop here again to comment. Why, why did the, the Pangulu, the headman, say, Surely not? Because this, if a person, uh, he does all kinds of uh, wrong, uh, uh, all kinds of offenses, uh, he takes life, he steals, he's an adulterer, etc. There is no logic that such a person can go to heaven, otherwise the world will be upside down. Then again the Buddha said, Again, headman, suppose a man hurls a huge great rock into a deep, deep pool of water, then a great multitude gathers and throngs together and aspires and praises it and goes about with uplifted palms, saying, Rise up, good rock, float up, good rock, float ashore, good rock. What do you think, headman, with that huge, great rock, because of the aspirations, because of the praises, because of the going about with uplifted palms of the great multitude, would it rise up or float up or float ashore? Surely not, Lord. Even so, headman, whatever man is a taker of life, a taker of what is not given, a wrongdoer in respect of sensual passion, a liar, a backbiter of bitter speech, a babbler and covetous with malevolent heart or perverted view, However much a great multitude gathering and thronging together might aspire and praise him and go about with 
uplifted palm, saying, May this man, when body breaks up, after death, be reborn in the happy lot in the heaven world. Yet would that man, when body breaks up after death, be reborn in the woeful lot, in the downfall in hell. Let's stop a while to comment. Yeah? The Buddha said, just like a, a, a big rock, when you throw it into the lake, yeah, it will sink because of its weight, it will sink. So however much you shout or you pray, this rock is not going to come up, it's brought up. In the same way, a person who has done a lot of evil, after death, his evil karma will drag him down like a huge rock. And however much you pray or you shout or you say, a man is still going to go down like a big rock. Then the Buddha said, now What do you think, head man? Suppose that in this case, there is a man who abstains from taking life, who abstains from taking what is not given, who abstains from wrong action in respect of sensual passion, from lying, from backbiting, from bitter speech and babbling, who is not covetous, not of malevolent heart, a man of right view, then a great multitude gathering and thronging together, aspires and praises him and goes about with uplifted palms, saying, May this man, etc., etc., be reborn in the woeful lot in hell. What think you, head man? Would that man, because of the aspirations and praises and going about with uplifted palms of the great multitude, be reborn in the woeful lot in hell? Then the head man said, Surely not, Lord. Here he is saying, uh, Surely not, because this person is a good man. He doesn't do evil. He does all all good actions, so there is no logic that such a person would be reborn in hell. Then the Buddha said, Suppose again, head man, a man plunges a jar of butter or a jar of oil into a deep, deep pool of water, and it breaks, and it becomes shreds or fragments, and sinks down to the bottom. But the butter or oil that was in it flows up to the top. Then suppose a great multitude gathering and thronging together aspires and praises it and goes about with uplifted palms saying, Sing down, good butter, sing in, good butter, go to the bottom, good butter or oil. What do you think, head man? Would that butter or oil, because of the aspirations and praises, going about with uplifted palms of the great multitude, would it sing down, would it sing in, would it go to the bottom? And the head man said, Surely not, Lord. Buddha said, even so, head man, whatever man abstains from taking life, etc., etc., however much a great multitude might aspire and pray for his rebirth in hell, yet would he be reborn in the happy lot in the heaven world. At these words, Asibandaka's son, the head man, said to the exalted one, excellent Lord, excellent it is, Lord, etc., then he took refuge in the Buddha. Now, this sutta, you see, at first the man asked the Buddha whether the Buddha can help us go to the heavens. And the Buddha is replying in an indirect way that he actually cannot help us. This is all due to the law of karma. If we have a lot of good karma, we will rise up and go to the heavens. Just like that light oil, oil that is in the water will, will float up. So if we do a lot of evil karma, uh, we will go down, uh, our evil karma will drag us down to the woeful place, just like that heavy rock will sing in the water. So what the Buddha is, say, is saying is that he actually cannot help us. It is all due to the law of karma. That is why we realize a sutta like this, uh, uh, we would depend on our own karma, not uh, Sort of expect the Buddha to help us to go to heaven or etc. And even all this praying, uh, later on you hear another sutta also, the Buddha said it's also of not much use. It's, it is actually the karma that counts. Now another sutta is uh, Anguttara Nikaya 5.5.43. Five things, householder, are not to be got by 
either by vows or by prayers, I declare. For if they were, why would anyone languish here? To bring about long life, householder, it is of no use for a noble disciple yearning for long life, either to pray for it or to think much of it. The way that leads to long life must be walked and is worked for by the noble disciple. And when the way is walked by him, it leads to the winning of long life, and he becomes a winner both of heavenly life and human life. So too of beauty, happiness, honor, and the heaven worlds. In this sutta, the Buddha said, now what we want in the world is not to be got by praying for it, but by making vows. The Buddha said it is of no use. The Buddha said, if praying and making vows is of any use, why is there still suffering in the world? There is still a lot of animals in the animal world. There is still a lot of ghosts in the ghost realm. There is still a lot of beings in hell. The hells have not reduced. So, the Buddha said, it's actually no use. It's all due to our karma. Suppose I view a simile. Suppose a person, say like a student, is studying for his SPM from 5. He suppose he believes that some, some being can help him. So he prays to this being. Maybe he's got a lot of faith. And he doesn't study. If he doesn't study and he prays to this being and hoping to get 9 A's, do you think that he will get 9 A's in his SPM? Surely not, isn't it? So, the first condition is that this boy must work hard. He must study hard. But you see, if this boy studies hard, there are also other factors in, you have to take into consideration. Suppose this boy, because of his past karma, is not a very intelligent boy. Even though he might study very hard every day, yet he is not likely to get 9 A's, right? Because he's not so intelligent. So, now another, another boy, you, know, you see, he studies very hard. And because of his past good karma, he's very intelligent. And this type of person is able to get nine A's. So from here we can deduce eh, that studying very hard is working the right karma in this life. And being intelligent is the karma from past life that helps him. So it is two things that help us. Karma in terms of past life and also the present life. Uh, we must not forget the present life karma is very important. Suppose a person only depends on his past karma, like a, a boy, for example, is very intelligent. But this life, even though he's very intelligent, he's lazy, he refuses to study hard. Would he be able to get 9 A's? Not likely, isn't it? So we have to depend on past life karma as well as this life karma. Both acting together will help us to achieve uh, what we want to achieve if we have the necessary karma. Another sutta in the Samyutta Nikaya uh, 22.99 At one time in Savati the Buddha said Incalculable because is the beginning of this round of rebirths. No beginning is made known of beings wrapped in ignorance, fettered by craving, who run on, who fare on the round of rebirths. There comes a time because when the mighty ocean dries up, is utterly drained, comes no more to be. But of beings hindered by ignorance, fettered by craving, who run on, who fare on the round of rebirths, I declare there is no end making. There comes a time because when Simeru, king of mountains, is consumed, is destroyed, comes no more to be. But of beings hindered by ignorance, fettered by craving, who run forever the round of rebirths, I declare there is no end making. There comes a time because when the mighty earth is consumed, is destroyed, comes no more to be. But of beings hindered by ignorance, etc., I declare no end making. I stop for a while to comment. Eh? Here the Buddha says eh, there is no end to the round of rebirths. The round
amount of rebirths will continue forever. Even though the world may end one day, eh, uh, might be burnt up, but it will come again uh, in a cycle. But beings in samsara, which who turn in samsara, will never come to an end. So, unless we make the effort to get out of samsara, we will just continue to turn in samsara. And again, the Buddha, uh, after this, the Buddha said, uh, just as because a dog tied up by a leash to a strong stake or pillar keeps running round and revolving round and round that stake or pillar, even so because the untaught, the untaught ordinary folk or put, putujana who discern not those who are Aryans, who are untrained in the worthy Dhamma, regard body as the self, regard feeling, perception, volition, consciousness as having a self, as being in the self, or the self as being in consciousness. So they run and revolve round and round, from body to body, from feeling to feeling, from perception to perception, from activities, or from volition to volition, from consciousness to consciousness. They are not released therefore, they are not released from rebirth, from old age and decay, from sorrow and grief, from woe, lamentation and despair. They are not released from suffering, I declare. But the well-taught Aryan disciple, because who discern those who are Aryans, who are trained in the worthy Dhamma, regard not, regard not body as the self, regard not the self as being in body, etc., etc. So they run not, revolve not round and round from body to body, from consciousness to consciousness, etc. They are released from birth, old age and decay, from sorrow and grief, Woe, lamentation and, dis and despair, the release from suffering, I declare. So the Buddha said, eh, uh, there are five things uh, that we cling to. So because of that, uh, we run round and round the samsara, the round of rebirth, just like a dog which is tied to a stake and uh, keeps going round and round and round. And uh, what are these five things? These five things are what is called the five khandhas in the Buddha's teaching. Uh, these five khandhas are, are five things uh, that we regard either as the self or uh, as belonging to the self. Or we think that we are inside the five khandhas. Or we think that the five khandhas are inside us. So, what are these five khandhas that we regard as the self? The first one is body. Body, because uh, it is very natural for all living beings uh, to regard these five things as being the yourself. Not only human beings, even animals, uh, ghosts, etc. All of us living beings, uh, we very naturally regard these five things as the self. First one is body. If your body is tall, you, you look at the, at the mirror and you say, I am tall, right? If your body is short, you say, I am short. If your body is beautiful, you say, I am beautiful. Uh, so it's very natural to regard the body as the self. Second one is uh, feeling. Because we have feelings, sometimes we are happy, sometimes we are sad. So we tend to think that this that is having the feeling or this thing that is inside the feeling, this must be I, this must be the self. Ah. So, when you're happy, you say, I'm happy. When you're angry, you say, he made me angry. Okay? Ah. So, uh, this feeling is another thing that we very naturally tend to, uh, to uh, link with the self. Third one is perception. Perception is... Uh, Seeing, hearing, uh, smell, taste, etc. We perceive these things. Uh, and uh, because we perceive, for example, we see, we see this form is dark or this form is light. Or we taste, this taste is, is uh, sweet or this taste is bitter, etc. So we tend to, to also think that this that perceives, this must be I. Then the fourth one is volition, volition, and uh, because we make 
uh, we use our will, we determine, for example, tonight you determine to come here, uh, you determine to do this, determine not to do this. So because you exercise this volition, this will, you tend also to think this must be I who is making all these decisions, making all this volition, this will. And the last one is consciousness. Uh, Consciousness actually is, is more connected with the with the six uh, with the six uh, six sense organs. Just now I said uh, seeing, uh, seeing, uh, hearing, smelling, tasting, touch, and uh, thinking. Uh, just to experience this is is consciousness. But perception is a bit different. Perception is to like differentiate. To, to to make a differentiation. For example, you see you see uh, when you see a form, the seeing itself is consciousness. But when you perceive, you might perceive, say, uh, this 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 form is tall or short or long or fat or the color is is uh, red or green or yellow or blue, etc. Uh, and uh, and uh, this, uh, the difference between uh, perception and consciousness in terms of uh, tasting, just to know that you have the taste, uh, to know that you, you have the taste is uh, plain consciousness, but to differentiate the, the taste into sweet taste or bitter taste or sour taste, etc., that is perception. Uh, so these, uh, these five things we naturally uh, connect with the self. We tend to think that uh, these things, these five things, that uh, these five khandas, is either the self or they belong to the self, or the self is inside the five khandas, or the five khandas are inside the self. So because of this concept, we cling to the five khandas. We regard the five khandas as connected with the self. And because we cling to the self, the Buddha said we continue to revolve around and around the round of rebirths. Now another sutta, uh, 22.59 in the Samyutta Nikaya. At Banaras in the Deer Park, uh, there was soon after the Buddha was, like, was enlightened, and then he addressed a group of five bhikkhus. He said, Body bhikkhus is not the self. If body bhikkhus were the self, then body would not be involved in sickness. And one could say of body, let my body be thus. Do not, do not let my body be thus. But bhikkhus, inasmuch as body is not the self, that is why body is involved in sickness. And one cannot say of the body, let my body be thus. Not let my body not be thus. Feeling is not the self. If feeling bhikkhus were the self, then feeling would not be involved in sickness. And one could say of feeling, let my feeling be thus, not let my feeling not be thus. Likewise with perception, volition, consciousness, etc. Uh, and consciousness. If, if these were the self, then they would not be involved in sickness. Uh, these five khandas is actually not the self because if anything were the self or belonging to the self what is yours what what is mine I have control over it for example if money is yours you can decide what you want to do with money whether you want to spend it on somebody or whether you want to keep it in the bank or whether you want to burn it or whether you want to throw it in the river whatever belongs to you you have total control over it, you have uh, power to do what you want with it. But because the, body, the Buddha said, these five khandas, we have no control over it. For example, your, your body, after the age of about 30, you start to grow old. Can you say, since body is yours, can you say, body, don't grow old, uh, or grow young? We cannot, right? Uh, when the body is sick, can you tell the body, don't be sick, be healthy? Can we do that? We cannot. So, 
the Buddha, the, the body is something that we cannot control. Uh, it just goes, goes up. Uh, from a baby it grows up and after about 30 it starts to grow old and after, when, when the conditions are, are, are not suitable for the body it becomes sick and when you are too old the body dies and then if we, if we uh, think that the, the body is the self then we become alarmed when the body is, is sick or the body dies and uh, the, the Buddha said similarly with the feelings Feelings also, we don't have much control over it. When the conditions are such that it makes us cry, for example, you are you love your son very much, and then your son is involved in a, an accident, and he suddenly he's killed, and then when you hear the news, you cry, and then can you suddenly think to yourself, why should I be crying? I should laugh. Can you laugh? When you're crying, you cannot laugh, right? Uh, the conditions make you cry, you cry. When the conditions make you laugh, you laugh. Uh, so, the also feelings are also quite beyond our control. It depends on conditions. The same with volition and consciousness uh, and perception. Uh, so, these, these, these uh, five things are not ours to control. That's why the Buddha said, these five things are not ours. Then again the Buddha said, what do you think, because is body permanent or impermanent? Then they replied, impermanent Lord. What is impermanent? Does that give you suffering or happiness? And then they said, suffering Lord. Then the Buddha said, then what is impermanent that gives you suffering, unstable by nature? Is it fitting to regard it thus? This is mine. I am this. This is myself. Then they replied, surely not, Lord. Similarly with feeling, perception, volition, consciousness. Therefore, because every body, whatever, be it past, future or present, be it inward or outward, gross or subtle, low or high, far or near, every body should be thus regarded as it really is by right insight. This is not mine. This is, this is not I. This is not myself. Every feeling, perception, uh, volition, consciousness, etc. So seeing because the well-taught Aryan disciple feels disgust for body, feels disgust for feeling, for perception, for the activities, for consciousness. So feeling disgust is repelled. Being repelled is free. Then knowledge arises in the free that, that he knows, uh, destroyed his rebirth, lived his the holy life, done is the task for life in these conditions, says no hereafter. So spoke the exalted one, and the band of five bhikkhus were pleased and welcomed what was said by the exalted one, and their hearts were released uh, without grasping from the asavas. So this sutta, the Buddha said, uh, these uh, five khandas we should not regard as the self, uh, it is uh, beyond our control. You see, these uh, five khandas, if we don't regard it as the self, we are not attached to it, ne? we won't suffer. We won't uh, suffer in the way that we would suffer if we were to be attached to it. For example, we talk about body. Besides our body, we are attached to those bodies that you think belong to you. For example, your family members, your husband or your wife or your son or your daughter. If anything happens to any one of them, you 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 feel a you you feel worried or you feel a lot of dukkha, a lot of uh, pain. But suppose you see some other person's son get involved in an accident or is killed, would you cry? You won't cry, right? We see some other person's son get killed and then you just look, but you don't feel. You don't feel the sorrow uh, which you would feel if that person were your son. So, the reason we don't feel that sorrow is because we are not attached to that, that person as being yours, as belonging to you. Uh, so, the Buddha said we should adopt this attitude. I think that this world belongs to us. It's all sort of on loan to us. Uh, even our own body is not ours to begin with. Uh, it just... Uh, came naturally into this world 
and one day will just uh, just be not around anymore. So the Buddha taught us not to be too attached to the five aggregates. Uh, these five aggregates, now uh, we tend to think as self. And what is self? Self is actually a concept every living being uh, creates, uh, conceives. We tend to conceive that there is a self inside us, something that is permanent, something that will not change, something that will exist forever. And this is this is something that we have built up for such a long time, uh, over so many lifetimes, that is very, very hard to destroy, very, very hard to, uh, to be free from. The Buddha said, our body, uh, we can see, we go old, we can see it changes, we can realize that sometimes it becomes sick, and we can see in the mirror we are getting old, maybe white hair comes out and all that. Uh. So we can see that uh, body is impermanent, but to realize that your mind is also impermanent, in fact even more impermanent, the mind changes faster than the body. Yet the Buddha said uh, it is very, very difficult to actually uh, realize that the mind is also impermanent and non, not self, anatta. Uh, Samyutta Nikaya. Uh, I won't read this sutta, but in this sutta, uh, 3.1.3, the King Pasanadi came to ask the Buddha whether there is any living being that does not die, that does not grow old, does not become sick. The Buddha said, You cannot find any living being. You can just cannot find any, any living being that does not grow old and uh, become sick and um, does not die. And then another sutta, Samyutta Nikaya 22.96, the Buddha talked to his disciples and the Buddha said, um, there is nothing that does not change in the world. Everything that exists in the world eh, must change. Uh, there is absolutely nothing that does not change. Even, you see, iron that is so hard, if you leave iron by itself, over the years, you find slowly it will rust. Uh, even iron so hard also will rust and slowly will change. Uh, so the Buddha said, uh, he took a, a, a piece of dried cow dung, uh, he put in his hand a small piece of dried cow dung, and he said, even such a small thing as this, he said, must change. He said, the Buddha said, if you can find anything in this world that will not change, that will stay uh, the way it is eternally, then the Buddha said, I will not teach you this path to end the suffering. Then there's another uh, sutta. Uh, this one I will read to you. Uh, Samyutta Nikaya. Uh, when body arises, uh, 
Dukkha will follow immediately. Sickness, decay and death will definitely follow. If you have body, you must have Dukkha, you must have sickness, you must have decay and death. Similarly with feeling, perception and volition. In other words, eh, these five khandhas can also be divided into two. It is body and mentality or mind. Uh, so, if you have body, the Buddha said, eh, you will have suffering. And if you have mind, you will also have suffering. In other words, you cannot find any living being that has body who does not suffer. You cannot find any living being that has mind only and does not suffer. You have body, you have suffering. You have mind, you have suffering. This is uh, definite according to the Buddha. But when you have the ending of body, you don't have body, have the seizing of body, then you also have the seizing of suffering, the ending of decay and death. You have the seizing of mind, you also have the seizing of suffering, the ending of decay and death. So, the way to end suffering actually eh, is to to have this uh, calming down, the coming to an end of body and feeling. But to understand this better, we have to see more suttas. Another sutta in the Anguttara Nikaya, this is uh, 4.5.48.45 On a certain occasion, the Exalted One was staying near Savati at Jeta Grove in Anatta Pindika Spa. Then Rohitasa of the Devas, when the night was waning, came lighting up all Jeta Grove with surpassing brilliance to see the Exalted One, and saluting him stood at one side. So standing, Rohitasa of the Deva said this to the, to the Exalted One, Pray, Lord, is it possible for us by going to know, to see, to reach the world's end, where there is no more being born or growing old, no more dying, no more falling from one existence and rising up in another? Then the Buddha said, Friend, where there is no more being born or growing old, no more dying, no more falling from one existence and rising up in another. I declare that that end of the world is not by going to be known, seen or reached. <coughs> and I stop here a while to comment. This Deva came to see the Buddha. Then he said, how can he go to the end of the world? Because he, he, he understands that the world is impermanent. Everything in, in the world is impermanent. So he wanted to go out of the world to a place where there is no more being reborn. And this Deva said, It is wonderful Lord, it is marvelous Lord. How well it is said by the Exalted One. Where there is no more being born, etc. Uh, that end of that world is not by going to be known, seen or reached. Formerly Lord, I was the hermit called Rohitasa, Goja's son one of psychic power, a sky walker. Such lord was my speed, just as if a stout bowman, for instance, a skilled archer, a practiced hand, a trained man, could with a light shaft shoot easily across a palm tree's shadow. Such was my speed. The extent of my stride was as the distance between the eastern and the western ocean. To me, lord, could end by going. The Lord, not to speak of the time spent over food and drink, eating, tasting, and calls of nature, not to speak of struggles to banish sleep, sleep and weariness. Though my lifespan was a hundred years, though I lived a hundred years, though I traveled a hundred years, yet I reached not world's end, but died before that. Wonderful indeed, Lord, marvelous it is, Lord, how well it has been said by the exalted one. Friend, where there is no more being born or going old, no more dying, no more falling from one existence and rising up in another, I declare that that end of the world is not by going to be known, seen or reached. Then the Buddha said, But friend, 
I declare not that there is any making an end of evil without reaching world's end. No, no, no offense in this very seven long body, along with its perceptions and thoughts, I have proclaim the world to be the origin of the world, the end of the world, and the path going to the end of the world. And this is a very, very important sutta. In this sutta, the Buddha says, to end suffering, we must reach the world's end. Only by reaching the world's end, uh, we can end suffering. But just now the Buddha says, to reach the world's end is not, you cannot go to reach the world's end. Then the Buddha says, actually in this body itself is the world. The origin of the world, the end of the world, and the path that goes to end to the end of the world is all within our body. So how are we to understand this? What do you mean by saying that the world is inside us? So let us consider for a while how do we know that the world exists? We know that the world exists eh, because we see, we see things in the world, we hear sounds in the world, we smell smells of the world, we taste things of the world, and things of the world touch us, contact, touch contact. Eh? And uh, uh, so these five uh, external sense doors eh, uh, make us aware of the world around us. And generally we tend to think eh, that the eye sees the world, the ear hears the sounds of the world. But again, let us consider if it is actually the eye that sees the world, suppose we were to take out our two eyes, maybe go for an operation, remove our two eyes and put the two eyes on the table, can we ask the two eyes to look at the world? Can the two eyes see the world? Two, two eyes cannot see the world, right? Ah. So it is not actually the two eyes that see the world. The two eyes help us to see the world. But actually what is it that sees the world? It is the seeing consciousness which arises in our mind. Uh -huh. So because we don't need the eye to actually see, yeah, we know, suppose tonight you go back and sleep. When you sleep, you close your eyes, right? And you begin to dream. And when you dream, you see a lot of pictures, isn't it? So it's like a TV, right? Uh, so you see, when you, when you sleep and you're dreaming, you're not using your eyes, and yet you can see. So, the seeing is in our seeing consciousness. Similarly with our hearing. When our hearing consciousness arises, then we hear. When the smelling consciousness arises, we smell. Uh, so, these things come from where? All these consciousness come from our mind. So, in fact, huh? And when the mind works, eh, the working of the mind is actually the creation of the world. Uh, because the, of the consciousness in the mind, so we, we, we believe that we see the world, we hear the sounds of the world, etc. But all this is in our mind. That's why the Buddha says the world is inside us, and the origin of the world, and the end of the world, and the path that goes to the end of the world. Uh, this is a very, very important sutta. So actually our mind is the one that creates the world for us. So depending on the state of your mind, the type of world that is created for you depends on the state of your mind. If a person is a very good person, has a very pure heart, then when you die here, the mind that creates for you, right, what you see here, Probably it's like heaven, heavenly sight. You see beautiful form, uh, beautiful maybe uh, babies as your wife. If you are a man, maybe you have a lot of babies as your wife. If you are a woman, maybe you have a lot of, you have this uh, handsome deva as your husband. Uh, eh? So you are very happy, you see, I'm in heaven. Uh, actually, it's your mind creating uh, this sight for you. And this, this, the, 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 Sounds you hear are beautiful sounds, heavenly sounds, heavenly smell, heavenly touch, etc. But if that person is a evil person, he does a lot of evil karma. When he dies here, the world that is created for him is, for example, like hell. All his, the sights that he sees are horrible sights, frightening sights. 
the sound that he hears are uh, uh, frightening cries, cries of distress, etc. Uh, the smell, the taste, the touch, etc. All are painful. For example, he gets stabbed, he gets cut, etc. Uh, so, all this is created by the mind. Uh, so, the state of the mind is very, very important. That's why in the Buddha's teaching, mind is foremost. Mind is the forerunner of all states. Uh, so, uh, we always cultivate the mind. Uh, but people who don't understand, uh, they think, why you Buddhists are very funny? The only thing of the mind is so important. What is the mind? The mind is inside here. I see the mind is not inside here. The whole world is actually in our mind. Right? In the Buddha's teaching. Now there is a sutta in the Diva Nikaya called the Kevada Sutta. In this sutta, there, there was a bhikkhu, there was a monk, eh, who uh, he wanted to he wanted to know, he had this question. So what did he want to, to what did he want to know? He wanted to know where do the four elements cease? The four elements are the the four elements that make up the world. That means uh, earth, water, uh, fire and wind. These are the things that make up this world, right? Uh, we are all made out of the four elements. So he wanted to know where do the four elements cease? Because where the four elements cease yeah, is where the world ceases. So he wanted to know this question. So he flew up to, he had this psychic power. He flew up to the heavens and he asked the, the deva, he asked the, the devas of the, uh, the four great kings. They could not answer him. Then he went to the Paratimsa heaven, heaven of the 33. They also could not answer him. Then he went higher and higher. Finally, he went to the great Brahma, and he asked the great Brahma also, the Bra great Brahma couldn't answer him. So the great Brahma asked him to go back and ask the Bhagava, the Arahant, Samasam Buddha. So he came back to ask the Buddha. But the Buddha knew that he went up to heaven to ask the, all these devas. And then the Buddha said, now you are coming back to me just like a bird that, uh, that you know, the ships that go in the olden times, yeah? When the ship sails, uh, they always carry the bird with them, you know, maybe a pigeon or something. And when they are uh, lost, uh, they don't know where land is, they don't know which direction to go. They, they, they leave the bird, then the bird will go up into the air and fly all around. And then when it sees land, uh, it will head for, for the land. So when the ship people, they see the, the, the bird flying off in a particular direction, they know that there is land there, then they will go there. But if there is no land around, the bird will fly and fly and fly and finally come back to the ship. So the Buddha said, you are just like that bird. You went up to the heaven to fly around here and there and finally you come back to me and ask me this question. So the Buddha said, ah, Bhikkhu, this question that you asked, you worded it wrongly. You should not have said, where do the four elements uh, cease without remainder? The Buddha said, you should have I ask the question in this way, where do the four elements no footing find? They cannot find a footing to arise. Then the Buddha said, uh, the four elements do not have a footing when consciousness ceases, when consciousness stops, when consciousness is uh, annihilated. And this sutta also is a very, very deep, profound sutta. Why did the Buddha say this monk asked this question wrongly? Why did the Buddha uh, say that uh, you should not ask where do the four elements cease without remainder? Because what the Buddha is trying to teach us is that actually the four elements or the whole world does not have an independent existence. The whole world actually exists in our mind. If the four elements exist by themselves, then they can cease by themselves. And you can say the four elements are cease. But because the four elements depend on consciousness to arise, only when our consciousness works, when our consciousness arises, yeah, then we perceive earth, water, fire, wind. 
In other words, for the world to arise, we must have consciousness. If you, do, your consciousness stops now, then the world for you has stopped. The world for you has come to an end. Uh, so, then the Buddha said, for the four elements to see, for the world to come to an end, uh, is when the consciousness ceases, when the consciousness is obliterated. Uh, uh, that is actually the state of Nirvana. Because there is the Sutta in the Samyutta Nikaya 22.87, uh, there was an Arahant who died, who entered Nibbana. So, after this Arahant entered Nibbana, the Buddha came to see his body. And when the Buddha came to see his body with his, with his other disciples, in the, in the far away, uh, the Buddha noticed a black cloud flying here and there, flying here and there. Then the Buddha asked his disciples, he said, uh, because you see in the far away, can you see a dark cloud flying here and there? He said, yes, Lord. Then the Buddha said, that is Mara. Mara is looking for the consciousness of Vakali, which is the other hand. The Buddha said, uh, Mara is trying to know where Vakali is reborn. Then the Buddha said, Mara will never find where Vakali is reborn. Vakali is not, will not be reborn anymore because the consciousness of Vakali has ceased. Consciousness of Vakali has stopped. It's obliterated. So that is the state of an Arahant when the consciousness has ceased. Just like the Buddha. When the Buddha has entered Nirvana, the consciousness has gone out like a flame, gone out. There is a simile the Buddha gave uh, of a match. Uh, Suppose you light a match, you light a match, uh, and then this match burns. Uh. Now, if the match burns uh, to, to its end, uh, and after the match has gone out, the light has gone out, can you ask, uh, where has this light gone to? Has it gone to the north, or to the south, or to the east, or to the west? The Buddha said, uh, if you ask like this, uh, it, 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 it does not fit. The, the problem, uh, this is a wrong question to ask because originally there was no light. When the conditions are light, are, are right, uh, the, the like for example, you strike the match, uh, you strike the match, the flame arises. But originally there is no flame. The flame only arises due, due to conditions. And when the conditions are such that the flame should be extinguished, uh, uh, it is extinguished and there's nothing more to burn. So, the Buddha said similarly yeah, for the Tathagata, when the Buddha enters Nirvana, you cannot say uh, whether the Buddha uh, exists or whether the Buddha uh, does not exist or whether the Buddha uh, both exists and does not exist or whether Buddha neither exists nor does not exist. This does not, it's not relevant because originally there is no such thing as Buddha. Ah, what the Buddha is trying to make us realize is everything is conditioned in this world. There is no one thing uh, that is permanent that will last forever. So again, uh, this similar of the light, the Buddha said, suppose you strike a, a, a match, then you have a light. Now when this light burns, uh, and then when it's coming to an end, uh, before is extinguished. You add three things. Uh, you add a light, uh, this uh, dry leaves, and you add dry twigs, and you add uh, uh, dry grass. By adding these three things, uh, the flame will continue to burn, right? Uh, so it continues to burn. And if you continue to add these three things, the grass, the leaves, and the twigs, uh, the flame will continue to burn. But when the when you stop adding these three things and the flame comes to an end and you don't add any more the leaves and the grass and the twigs, the flame will be extinguished, right? So in the same way the Buddha said, these three things represent greed, hatred and delusion. As long as we have greed, hatred and delusion, the fire for existence will continue to burn. Uh, so when, 
one life comes to an end, the fire becomes very small. But it is not extinguished. Uh, because we still have good hatred and delusion, you burst up into flames again. Uh, then to you, you think you have another life. Uh, so uh, the round of rebirths will continue as long as greed, hate and delusion. Uh, we continue to feed uh, these three things. Uh, only when we cut off greed, hate and, and delusion, uh, then uh, there is no more condition for the flame to burn. There is no more condition for the consciousness to, to exist. Uh, so then it will be extinguished. So if we understand this type of sutta, uh, then we will uh, depend on our own karma. We won't have to really pray to the Buddha for this or that. We don't have to pray to the Bodhisattva or to the Arahant for this and that. Buddha said, all is mind me. And depending on the state of your mind, uh, you create your own world. So I think for the time being, I will end here. Uh, and uh, if you have some questions to ask. Karma uh, that the Buddha spoke, I uh, think we must understand that the Dharma is very profound. Uh, but because living beings uh, are, are, are at different levels, of understanding. Sometimes when when we say certain things, uh, we have to be quite careful. So if a person uh, is very attached, is a, of a devotional nature, he likes to pray to the Buddha images and to the Bodhisattvas and all that. Uh, to tell him, like, uh, to cut it off entirely, yeah? he might not be able to do it. Yeah? But uh, we try to make him understand the the the, the true Dharma, the Dharma. When a person understands the Dharma, then slowly he, by his own free will, he will slowly uh, give up his attachment to prayers and all that. So we cannot tell the person, for example, don't do this, a uh, very silly uh, bodo thing to do and all these things. Uh. But we try to explain the Dharma to him and hopefully uh, he will, by understanding the Dharma, he will slowly uh, give up these uh, lesser practices. Uh. Like a lot of these rites and rituals, uh, uh, we cannot eliminate, eliminate it entirely uh, for some people. Uh. But because there are different levels of people, for example, you see certain, uh, like, MBMC, uh, Malaysian Buddhist Meditation Center, <coughs> because they cater to meditators, people who meditate, yeah? so they don't, they, they don't uh, do things like uh, uh, chanting very much, uh, and they don't, they don't encourage people to pray and all that. So it depends on the level of that person. So we can only try to lead people to progress. But these two parts that I spoke tonight, uh, they are very profound and they are at a very high level. Uh, unless you already have a fairly uh, reasonable understanding of the Dharma, you might not be able to understand uh, the significance of these suttas, but uh, because um, I see that uh, these type of suttas are seldom spoken, uh, so I, I feel that there's also a need to cater also for some of those who understand more of the Dharma. I'm sure just now you had a very heavy dosage of the Dharma. <laughs> I don't know whether you can digest it or not. Uh, first and foremost, you must understand that there are two languages. Religious language and worldly language. Just now he has used only religious language, but not worldly language. If there is any difficulty for you to understand, 
cities that you use only worldly language. After gaining his enlightenment, when he surveyed the world or the mentality of human beings, the Buddha realized actually it is useless to preach, to tell this kind of dhamma to these people who are narrow-minded, lopsided, who are misled, deluded with wrong concept and belief. So he was thinking what to do now. But formerly he never had that wisdom because he didn't gain enlightenment at that time. So slowly he started to preach. It has taken for a long period for people to understand. I can get, tell you a simple incident. The attitude of the other religious groups in India at that time towards the Buddha or his teaching. So one day, when the Buddha was going somewhere, he met another religious man. He knew that this person is a very strange and religious man, but not belong to their own religious group. Then he asked, who you are? What do you preach? What is your religion? Then the Buddha, in simple language, explained what he preached. After listening to the Buddha, how this man acknowledged his uh, preaching, so explanation is like this. Uh, that was the attitude of the people. The Buddha had to work in such a society at the beginning to convince them, to enlighten them. So just now, I was listening to various quotations that Reverend High uh, presented. And all these quotations that he mentioned will be out very soon in my latest book, The Treasure of the Dhamma, the 14 chapters, this kind of things of the Buddha. Reverend High explained that everything is going on changing, changing, changing in this world. It is true. I have been watching, observing him for the last 30 years. When he was working in Kwantan as an engineer, he was a member of BMS also. He was very active, very enthusiastic Buddhist. Later he changed his way of life, gave up his job and went to America to study Buddhism, to practice Buddhism, change his way of life. After studying, practicing, he started to think. Then he found out. That way of life is not convincing, appealing to his mind. He gave up and again came back to Malaysia. When he came back, his sisters, or his mother is there, one of his sisters also there, and two of them are in Australia, when we were in Perth, Australia, they attended to us. They approached me, asking whether is it possible for us to accommodate him in this temple. I said no. Why? Because I know him very well. <laughs> that is why I said no. He was trained and he has learned 
one way of life as a Buddhist way of life. And our way of life differs. Therefore, there will be some clashes and conflicts. To avoid this, better to find out another suitable place for him. Then he can carry on his religious way of life peacefully. After that, he decided to go to Thailand and obtain the higher ordination and started to learn Pali and Buddhism very deep. And again, came back to Malaysia. He does not like to live in the society. Always go and stay under the rocks or jungles or certain isolated places. But started to think very deeply and started to write to introduce the basic teachings of the Buddha, not Buddhism, basic teachings of the Buddha. Just now he mentioned the, what the Buddha taught, not Buddhism. Now he has become a controversial figure in Malaysia. Those who are used to certain schools, tradition, customs, cannot agree with his writings and writing. Anyway, he is honest. He is trying to introduce the basic teaching, but not Buddhism, as I mentioned. In Buddhism, there are so many things that we have incorporated for the last 2,500 years in different countries. So we are not ready to accept all these things as the Dhamma taught by the Buddha. Dhamma is deep. It is difficult to understand. Why it is difficult to understand our minds are misled, deluded with wrong concept. If we want to learn what we have to do, first we have to unlearn what we have learned. Otherwise you never learn. When you mix up the Dhamma with the wrong concept, the old belief and tradition that you are keeping in your mind, you never realize the Dhamma. You never realize the truth. You had to withdraw what you have learned earlier. Uh, then you can learn very easily. Otherwise, always there will be conflict and confusion. So the talk that he gave today is a real Dhamma taught by the Buddha, but it will take long time for you to understand. One word taught by the Buddha, we had to think, we had to analyze, we had to observe, we had to concentrate, and then later the realization is appear. That is the nature of the Dhamma. There is nothing for us to accept through belief or faith, but through understanding. What we believe today, after few days or few months or few years, time will give up, knowing that belief is wrong. Whatever faith we have today, we change later. This is the nature of the mind. But when you accept anything through understanding, then there is nothing for us to change. We maintain that forever. That is the truth. 
The Dhamma taught by the Buddha is the truth. He never tried to convince people by using sugar-coated words. Because there is no truth. What is Dhamma? If there is anything that you don't like, uh, that is Dhamma. If there is anything that you like, it is not Dhamma. Just now, Reverend I mentioned, our consciousness will be ended. But you don't like it. <coughs> when we attain nirvana, there is no person to live in that nirvana. But you don't like it. Uh, these are the things that you like. You want someone to live. Uh, then you like it. But it is not the truth. It is our belief. Absolute truth. When we analyze, we can understand this very clearly. We are attached to certain things which console our craving. When things are not in favor of our craving, we don't like it. But the truth remains there. So don't try to find out the answer to satisfy your craving, your attachment, your inclination. The truth is not there. Now take another example. Why do we suffer? Just now Reverend High mentioned we are attached to my aggregate. When these aggregate goes wrong, not in our favor, because of our attachment and craving toward this by aggregate, we suffer, we worry. If that attachment is not there, we never suffer, we never worry. Now that is the truth. By keeping our attachment and craving towards anything, we cannot stop suffering, we cannot stop worries. If we want to get rid of sufferings and worries, we have to detach our mind from these things. Then we will be free. That is true. It is the truth, but you don't like it. I think this is enough, 9.30. So, on your behalf, so, I thank Rather and I, I hope many more opportunities arise. You will come again and give us another Dhamma talk. It's very rich, although some people cannot understand. It is not his mistake or his weakness, but our weakness. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Transference of merit, sharing of merit. <laughs> Please follow me here.
Thank you. 